humans uh, have developed into uh, organisms where we're pretty much the only mammal that have impaired breathing. <laughs> if we look at if we look at skull structures um, over the last 200 years, um, our, our skull structure has changed quite a bit. Our sinuses and stuff like that, and it has to do with you know more more softer and processed foods and accessible to foods a lot easier. You know, no one's no one's you know. No one's chewing the bicep off of a, a rhinoceros anymore, right? So our utility of our jaw structures and stuff like that is a whole lot less. So the number one cause, I think, is looking at really the way we breathe. And most people um, don't have a concept of breathing, quote unquote, normally. It's because um, a lot of people are born not breathing you know, correctly. So much of our lives and health is dependent on our brain health. Everything from our mood, memories, sleep, and daily activities relies on a healthy brain. What can we do to keep our brain in its best shape? Today, Dr. Chung Ran joins us to do a deep dive into how our breath, skull health, and lifestyle impact our brain health. I am Dr. Andrew Wong, co-founder of Capital Integrative Health. This is a podcast dedicated to transforming the consciousness around what it means to be healthy and understanding the root causes of disease and wellness. Dr. Ron is a board certified internal medicine physician, a functional medicine practitioner, and founder of the Texas Center for Lifestyle Medicine. He works with patients to find the root causes of their conditions using the best of lifestyle and nutrition and much more. Join us for a conversation about how our brains are impacted by breath work, meditation, chewing, the health of the skull, and what actions we can take to support our brain health for the long term. Welcome, Dr. Ron, to the podcast. Uh, Chang, thanks so much for coming on today. We're so excited to, to have you on to talk about brain health and a variety of other, other functional topics. Uh, finally, good to get together with you and uh, have a podcast with you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me on. Appreciate you. We'd like to talk first today about kind of your background or story. I think everyone's just kind of interested in that or listeners is, you know, you've been a functional medicine leader now for uh, integrative and functional leader for, for a number of years now, different, different companies, your own clinic as well, really shaping the, uh, the narrative of landscape. A lot of, a lot of doctors too, training other doctors on, you know, how to, how to make this more accessible for, for, you know, the population at large. So let's just start first uh, with kind of how you decided to become an integrative and functional doctor. Yeah, sure. So my, um, my origin, I guess, is um, my mother is an acupuncturist and Chinese medicine doctor for a number of years. And my father, is, he's an MD, PhD. So it's been sort of integrative, like my whole life, if you will. And I think that uh, um, there's no other way to really look at medicine, you know, other than this. And, um, and I was never really big into labeling like the type of medicine. I think medicine really just should be medicine. I'm trying to really change that within the actual landscape um, and be more inclusive um, in letting the patients really decide what their path really wants, uh, really want to be rather than, you know, us dictating health or companies dictating health and stuff like that. So kind of a bit of a shift of power, let the, let the patients be their own heroes and kind of decide exactly what direction they want to go. We always say here that, you know, the patient is the CEO of their own health, right? Why would, why would we want to be the CEO of their own body, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Right, right. Absolutely. And, and the, um, the, the, one, the one thing that I always grew up with, um, you know, I'm, I'm the sixth generation of doctors in the family. And so the one thing I always grew up with is when I was a little kid in China, I grew up in China, um, my, my grandfather who basically was the, the oldest and most senior uh, uh, doctor of the village, always had a line of people kind of out the door um, because he's one of the first people to incorporate more of the Western medicine, you know, the aspirins and NSAIDs and stuff like that into like the Eastern culture, right? And so he was a really huge proponent of that in rural China and Southeast China. And so that's what he was kind of known for. And so um, I wanted to kind of fulfill that legacy by bringing a lot of the Eastern concept into, <laughs> into the Western world. And so that was always my, my vision ever since I was about three years old. And so um, I, I guess I never really wanted to do anything else. Um, and then when I, when I start training uh, here and uh, for 
medical school and residency and, and chief residency. And, you know, I noticed that, um, that I was starting to kind of um, drift away from my origin uh, because there, were, there was no incorporation of, of my origin into um, clinical training, right? And in fact, a lot of the things that are taught in, in Western medicine is observation-based. So we observe a group of symptoms. We're going to label it something. It goes into a diagnostic code, right? Which is sort of the opposite of what we generally do in Eastern medicine. Uh, the Eastern medicine is what function uh, is, is not right. So instead of saying like headache, abdominal pain, uh, leg swelling, and joint pain, we're like, well, that's one thing. <laughs> you know, in Eastern medicine, that, that's a pattern. And so, um, and so the, the, the collection of, of patterns and observations from a Western medicine standpoint um, became really focused on, I think, coding and data collection and stuff like that. And I think medicine has really transformed uh, from, a data, uh, from something that's relatively holistic in the 1950s, even in the U.S., to something that's very focused on data collection and outcomes and stuff like that, which has good it has good good and bad points. But I wanted to really uh, re refocus on exactly what medicine should be. And there's a few points there, but certainly in integrative functional medicine, we focus on the root cause physiology and, like you said, what's kind of underneath the hood, what's causing things, rather than labeling for diagnostic purposes. So it's, instead of a diagnosis, we come up with what's functional or dysfunctional. Just like you said, in Eastern and Western medicine, it's really, it's all just good medicine, depending where the patient is and where, you know, we are as practitioners. Like that's what Mark Hyman said, essentially, was we should eventually just call this good medicine. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that uh, at the heart of every doctor in this country, um, every doctor is the heart of a functional medicine doctor. And it's because every doctor wants to get to the root cause. But I'll tell you, and you know, you probably know this as well, is that through residency, we weren't really trained to look at the root cause outside of the hospital system. You know, um, we're really good at, at root cause analytics. Like if someone's an inpatient and we'll figure out where the infection's coming from and stuff like that. From an outpatient perspective, it almost became almost like a triage for inpatients. So, you know, our emergency care is phenomenal in the U.S. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it's, it's, it's. It's crazy that we can't apply a lot of the, the same concepts uh, into uh, outpatient care, uh, but I think we're we're really changing that after, uh, since the pandemic started. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's well. Well, actually, let's get into that before we get into like what kind of conditions sure. you want to work with. So, how do you feel like the pandemic has sort of changed the landscape of of how we, you know, look at outpatient medicine and chronic health conditions? Well, first of all, um, bureaucracy. <laughs> and administrative patterns within the United States have changed pretty dramatically. If you look at what it takes to for a doctor to get a uh, credential with Medicare uh, now compared to before the pandemic, all of a sudden everything's electronic, things are so much faster, right? Um, and then the, all the red tapes, my gosh, there were so many red tapes into getting medical licensure uh, before it's, it's, it's kind of gone now, <laughs> you know? And there's a lot of advancement in the technology that's able to do that. So there's there's a force. It was a it was a forced hand. That's that's the that's the first part. The second part is um, you have a lot of the public is, is adaptive technology. You know whether it's Zoom or any other online platforms. So you have a population uh, who went from very little exposure to like telemedicine to about half the population having had some sort of telemedicine in the last two years. But you don't see that, you know, within a one year change, but we did uh, with the pandemic. Uh, and then another really good example is a QR code. Like everyone knows what a QR code is if they've ever went to a restaurant in the last two years because you scan your QR code, you go on to the menu, right? And so um, this, this concept of digitalizing is, um, whether it's health or, or food or anything like that, is, um, is, is a normal thing and a normal process, you know, these days. So I think the, the, the adoption of what medicine could be is really uh, shifted. And I akin this to um, in the 1950s, and that was on another podcast uh, very recently, uh, interviewed by a physician who's 81 years old. And he akin this to, um, hey, when TVs first came out, it was a big deal. And all of a sudden, doctors were uh, having to uh, combat against TV um, broadcasts called commercials, right? And so 
and it was a it was a huge issue at that time because they didn't really know how to do it because the media was 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 uh, was, was coming into play because TV started as government programs and it turned to media and mm. commercials, mm -hmm. and now we're kind of seeing the same thing but on a very massive scale and pattern, and that's not going to change anytime soon. So I think the evolution of medicine uh, is able to uh, be accelerated should the right players be there. Now you know as well as I do that not all doctors are going to be doing telemedicine or wanting to do group visits to share medical appointments and stuff like that, which I think is really the wave of the future. Um, but this is where, um, where everything becomes accelerated because of the mass necessity, because of ease of access, because of the changing the bureaucracy reimbursement for telemedicine and stuff like that. So I think uh, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that, that we're able to accelerate health. In this I agree. It is a first hand, but you know, certainly telemedicine and, and, you know, group visits on telemedicine are ways to really accelerate the democratization of some of the access to the root cause of medicine that both you and I practice. So th thank right. you for that. And just um, in terms of going pivoting now to clinical, um, what kind of conditions do you see in your clinic that you most often like to work with? Um, well, let me, let me, tell you how we kind of developed Texas Center for Lifestyle Medicine. That was developed in 2017 and the model was not what I imagined. So we wanted to have integrative health within the insurance and Medicare, uh, Medicaid and government insurance and setting and marketplace insurance setting. And it was not the easiest thing in the world because it's not really set up for that um, until uh, we started with our health coaches and things kind of turned around a little bit. The clinically speaking, if you think about what we actually do, we take insurance, uh, and then, and not only that, we we get to the, we try to get to the root cause of disease. So we naturally get really complex people. All the rare disorders that I never thought I would see in clinical practice in med school, we're seeing them. You know, every other patient is like this, you know, hereditary connective tissue Ehlers Danlos type patient, and. And uh, it's stuff that I never thought I would utter outside of, you know, medical boards and stuff like that. And so now it's become really commonplace. And then uh, what we realized very quickly is that um, medicine is not lost, not necessarily by because of the design, but it's really lost because there's no incorporation of communication into how doctors really uh, approach the patients and the families. And so um, we just, you know, we're not smarter than anybody else. We just communicate a whole lot more. So we're able to get more data points, right? And we utilize those data points uh, to support everything that's going on. And so um, we really quickly realized that if we start with belief systems, um, then we can be extremely powerful. And we've kind of evolved into that, which naturally took our entire attention into like brain health, right? And um, because the brain holds the most number of mitochondria or the energy subunits in all our bodies. So uh, whenever something's wrong, our brain's gonna tell us first. Um, the downside is most people are taught to ignore the brain, right? And so what we do is we start leveraging brain technology to look at, instead of just, just doing labs, we look at brain technology to look at patterns and start finding associated disease states. And then we're like, okay, you know, we're, we're really going to shift the focus into what the brain is really telling us to uh, let us know what's going on in other parts of the bodies. And that really turned into something that's really magical because people are getting better faster. We're looking at better outcomes. Um, and even through the, the coronavirus pandemic, we can look at patterns of the brain, you know, after, you know, COVID infections and vaccines and stuff like that, that um, is very interesting. And it simulates other things as well. So we're better to able to categorize uh, disease states by looking at brain patterns. So that's the main focus right now. Yeah, yeah. I think um, you actually introduced me to the QEGs and uh, started to work a lot heavily with them too. So, so thank you for that. And we know that, like you said, it really can identify some of the, the, the root causes of, of maybe pathology or dysfunction in terms of the brain. What would right. you say would be the, the top three causes of sort of brain dysfunction, if there were top three of that? There is, there is. Uh, number one is uh, the way we breathe. Um, humans uh, have developed into uh, organisms where we're pretty much the only mammal that have impaired breathing. <laughs> if we look at <laughs> If we look at skull structures um, over the last 200 years, um, our, our skull structure has changed quite a bit, our sinuses and stuff like that. 
And it has to do with, you know, more, more softer and processed foods and accessible to foods a lot easier. You know, no one's, no one's, you know, no one's chewing the bicep off of a, a rhinoceros anymore, right? So our utility of our jaw structures and stuff like that is a whole lot less. So the number one cause, I think, is looking at really the way we breathe. And most people um, don't have a concept of breathing, quote unquote, normally. It's because um, a lot of people are born not breathing you know, correctly, which is interesting because this completely ties back into my culture, which is you know, a lot of the Tai Chi qigong a lot of the breathing exercises mindfulness and meditative exercises have a huge impact on on brain pattern i mean if you think about it this is this is not surprising if um if you go to a scary movie you see a scary scene you start holding your breath when a scary scene comes on your face goes white basically your outside perception is shutting off blood flow to your face right so it's a physiologic mechanism in preparation for that fight or flight and that's, that's breath control versus um, if you uh, get angry about something and then you get really ticked off and start hyperventilating, your face gets red, which means there's blood flow more directed uh, in that direction. So there's a lot of physiologic mechanisms that happen with breath that we're seeing. So one, one is breath, two is light. And number three um, is the circadian rhythm, which is affected by number one and two. So the circadian rhythm is our day-night cycle. It's how we regenerate. It's how we take away our damaged cells, a phase called autophagy. And the regeneration is from stem cells and upregulation and stuff like that. And so that mechanism is actually rooted in deep sleep. Now, one in three people do not have great deep sleep um, for a multitude of reasons. The stressor is a little bit different. And, you know, we have the light coming in and we have impaired breathing mechanisms. You know, allergies is one of the main causes of... Um, of, of issues and so you have this sort of trifecta of air light and breath and this trifecta of air light and breath um, really needs to be optimized so that disease states can really improve and so we didn't really respect this process before um, because we kind of went around it we started we used to start with gut health we used to start looking at like environmental toxicity and stuff like that None of that was very helpful um, because we don't optimize air, light, um, sorry, breath, uh, light, and sleep. Then all the other stuff that's really out there is so variable and it's really complex to, uh, to, to get a hold on, on health. But when we start focusing on that, um, unapologetically on that, then um, people are getting better quicker. Um, and it's fascinating. Actually, it doesn't even matter what the disorder is. It's, it's fascinating how quickly they get better. So it's been a journey. Well, BLS, I think that's a good, um, you know, we have all trained in um, BLS or ACLS. So BLS is a good <laughs> healthcare. Yeah. BLS basic is life a good, support. Bas yeah. Basic life support. Well, this does basic life. Breath, breath yeah. light, and, and sleep is basic life support, really. Absolutely. Fine, right. Um, so um, I have some sub questions based on that. Let's kind of go back to breath for a second. So yeah. do you think it's the chunk, do you think it's the chicken or the egg thing in terms of our skull and jaw, you know, anatomy and stuff has changed over the last 200 plus years, let's say, or more, right. um, has the changes been some of the root cause of why we don't breathe as much now, or is it just about the breath and we're not, you know, we're stuck in a fight or flight, flight mode and we're not, we're not breathing correctly, but is the structure also impairing that ability to breathe correctly? Um, I, I think it's that, I think it's, it's actually, um, our, our lives are changed quite a bit. You know, look, if you look at human evolution, the, the frontal lobe of our brain is getting bigger. It's crowding out the sinus spaces. Mm. The way we, we make, um, balance in life is actually through nasal breathing. So, uh, you're, uh, right around, uh, next to the bridge of your nose, you have two structures on uh, one on each side. It's called the paranasal sinus. The paranasal sinus is responsible for the upregulation and production of most of the nitric oxide within our, our body and systems. Nitric oxide is kind of an important thing uh, because nitric oxide allows our body to balance, allows our brain to come into the calm state, allows our blood vessels to, to dilate. So a lack of nitric oxide is predisposed to diabetes and dementia and hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. 
So, um, you know, that, that's such a, and it's, that's, that's very common to look at from a pharmaceutical perspective, because there's people that's making uh, things that can improve the nitric oxide at one level or another, but then if you don't take care of the breath part, it's, it's may not be very, very useful. Um, if we take, uh, if we take another set of animals, uh, the baboon, for example, who are actually born without uh, paranasal sinuses, um, these animals have a smaller frontal lobe, higher aggression levels, higher blood pressures. So we can see, you know, what happens from a, from a, from an evolutionary standpoint in, in that mammal, right? But for us and for, for all mammals, uh, we need that, that those sinuses to be clear and working for us not to develop a lot of chronic disease states. Now, this is, this ties into gut health as well is because our gut microbiome is purely dependent on the air that moves into your paranasal sinuses. So if someone has chronic seasonal allergies, I expect them to have gut problems, right? If someone is, is been on a million different diets, right? And nothing seems to work. Well, we look at the way we look at nasal structures and breath and stuff like that. So that's, that's where we start working with ENTs and, and dentists and stuff like that to look at what we can optimize. And, um, and we look at sleep disorders. One in four people have some level of obstructive sleep apnea, uh, narcolepsy as well as really underdiagnosed. So, but most of those people also have structural abnormalities within the, uh, within the, the skull cavities. Um, and the way we know that is because there's people with hereditary disorders that can't make good quality collagen. And these are called hypermobile people. Um, one class of it is called the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And they all, uh, in my practice, they all have obstructive sleep apnea, no matter how thin or how big they are. It's because their soft tissue structures, the skull structures have a very hard time accommodating to, uh, to air. And a lot of them have narcolepsy and dysautonomia and POT syndrome and stuff like that. So all these, all these different um, quote unquote rare disorders we're seeing more frequently now and even Alzheimer's dementia is because um, our airways are constantly plugged up with, with stuff, <laughs> you know, allergies, environmental toxins and stuff like that. And so, uh, and, and after we deal with that, you can see people's uh, brain patterns change in honestly as little as a week. And when we do that with the QEEG, um, measuring brain frequency waves, and we compare that to the normal population. So um, I think the evidence is there um, and this is a lot more easier to, to swallow, if you will, it's easier to understand than looking at some other causes that may be a little more difficult to understand of, of brain degeneration. Yeah, uh, you said a lot of really um, nuggets of uh, wisdom there. I, I think the main thing that I got from out from the part about nitric oxide is that you need an O to help modulate a healthy gut microbiome. Is that correct? That's, yes. that's a big part of it. Right. Um, and then, and then also going to see a myofacial specialist or, or a biological dentist or someone that can, you know, use MFR, use some of the airway devices in addition to, you know, supplementing that with ENT care. I mean, it sounds like sinuses are really important and the skull, you know, cavity and the anatomy is really important to have proper breathing uh, yeah. in addition to having mindfulness, et cetera. Right. And, and that evidence is really apparent, right? So my mother's an acupuncturist. And one of the first things to do um, when it comes to some of the chronic disorders is um, we look at their posture. If someone comes in and their elbow is kind of, or not elbow, I'm sorry, their shoulder is, is kind of elevated towards the ears, which a lot of people are, and maybe they're a little lopsided and they have like autoimmune disease and gut disorders and stuff like that. Well, the first thing would be like, whoa, what is, what is causing that, right? And if you go to an acupuncturist or a cranial sacral therapist, the first thing to work on is fascia. And fascia is the outer covering muscle. And the fascia is designed for us to protect ourselves, constant fight or flight, right? And so if an acupuncture needle were to go on the top of the head, there's an immediate release of fascial tension. And this patient may actually fall asleep right, right after that goes in. We see that a lot in autoimmune disorders, right? And so, um, and so what we want to really respect is symmetry. So not just symmetry of the skull, but symmetry of the spine, symmetry of um, our hips and our, and our knees and our ankles. And of course, most of that is kind of rooted in the spine, but without symmetry, very few things can be restored. I mean, 
you can have uh, severe scoliosis or hip issues uh, where one leg may be a little shorter than another. And then you have a gut disorder. You can go on any sort of elimination diets all you want, but a lot of that, those are, are those, those are temporary um, because it's not a dietary issue. There's a symmetry issues that we really have to restore first. By restoring symmetry, you can increase your lymphatic drainage to different parts of the body. You can uh, improve your detoxification mechanisms. Uh, and then you can start regenerating in deep sleep because symmetry also improves deep sleep. That's why when people sleep on pillows that are not so great for them and they have neck pain, they don't have great deep sleep. You wake up brain fog the next day, right? And these are the things that, you know, are, are that we actually look at first from a, from a structural standpoint. And then we kind of do the other more detailed stuff afterwards. I love that focus on structure, function, diet. It sounds like they both need to be addressed um, by directions, right. but certainly from a brain perspective, you know, it is almost like in some ways we could, we could almost argue that it's a top-down mechanism. The brain is controlling or directing a lot of the other organ function, the tissue function, you know, like you said, taking right. that point at the top of the head. I think maybe you're talking about governor vessel 24, uh, was it? No, not 24. Um, the one at the top of the head. Now, now I'm uh, medical. I took the medical acupuncture is getting rusty, but uh, right at the top of the head there is, I think, uh, a really good point for um, depression as well, too. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> the, uh, there's another really high level of evidence type that can really explain our our symmetry and breath and stuff like that. Is that um, those people with um, who suffer from hormonal disorders. Um, hypothyroidism, early onset menopause, they tend to have what's called a high power to frequency ratio of the theta waves in the brain. The theta waves is um, supposed to be um, sleep waves, right? But we're seeing the, a lot of the theta waves in, uh, in when they're awake. And this is done on our, our QEEG device called BrainView. And so um, I'm able to kind of correlate major hormonal issues in men, it could be low T as well, to this high power to frequency ratio on theta waves. Well, this is also this theta waves power that gets elevated when you have hypersomnia, basically sleepier during the daytime. And we're able to correlate that with sleep apnea. And we know that sleep apnea is one of the main root causes of hormonal imbalance. It doesn't matter what hormone it is. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, um, and then we can look at brain patterns of people with chronic pain. So those most people have higher uh, pain perception whenever they have airway diseases, sleep apnea, um, uh, a lot of you know, light coming into the eyes, especially doing a lot of computer work. So the perception of pain is, is quite high. And this is why when people get migraines, they get photophobic. Like they, it's really hard for them to look at light. They have to be in a dark room because there's just too much stimulus that's going on. If we take that in, into a micro scale, into what people are on a daily basis, then we can understand that over time, a lot of what we're doing from a behavioral standpoint uh, could be quite destructive, you know, to our process. And this is what I like to focus on because it's behavioral changes. It um, doesn't cost any money to breathe. It doesn't cost any money to decrease light, right? Um, and so I think that by, by pulling the lever on the things that, that, aren't a huge inhibitor to the wallet and also can make the greatest outcomes. I think that's where health really should, should head. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, that's, that's so great. Um, kind of going a little more into brain health now. Um, yeah. What do you think about inflammation and, and brain health? I know that's a, like a huge yeah. topic and, and certainly in functional medicine, a lot of, a lot of uh, experts and speakers say, you know, inflammation is the root cause of all chronic disease. Um, is inflammation the primary root cause of, of brain dysfunction? I know you mentioned BLS, uh, you know, overall, um, meaning breath, light, sleep. Um, do all those BLS subcomponents essentially cause brain inflammation? Or what is your view of that? Really good question. Well, first of all, we have to honor inflammation, we have to be thankful for it. Without inflammation, none of us will be alive. <laughs> so, yes. Um, so it's not about root causes inflammation. The root cause is something that prop that the body necessitates inflammation for. So inflammation is great because we know something's wrong. And if you choose to ignore inflammation or cover it up with medications, then um, that's, that's our choice, right? We're, we're kind of suffering the consequences. And that's where we see a lot of chronic diseases go uncontrolled. 
So um, I never like to use the I word with the inflammation word because it's so general, right? And it also, you, we don't know what to do about it when it comes to this. So it becomes very, um, very taxing to, to anybody who is trying to like get, get a hold of things. You know, if patients come in and say, I want to decrease my inflammation, I'm like, well, okay, that's, that doesn't necessarily mean anything because we have to look at your whole life, right? So yes, a lot of the impaired airway mechanisms can increase inflammation uh, more than what we should have. Um, and, uh, and if we look at chronic disease states and brain health, I mean, let's just look at the Alzheimer's uh, model for a second. We have oh, people with Alzheimer's develop sort of these plaques and tangles within their brain. And thank God, because if they weren't there, uh, we have seizures, we would die much earlier on. So we need those plaques to sequester whatever the hell's going on uh, inside our noggin, right? So whether it's infections or toxins, stuff like that. And so if, uh, so the, the plaques themselves aren't the pathological thing, right? It's, it's part of our immune response. Now we just have to figure out, well, what, what is causing that? Is, is it cigarette smoking? Is it because, you know, I live really close to an interstate that has a lot of pollution? Is it because I have mold in my house that's causing blockages of my paranasal sinuses so I can't make nitric oxide? And therefore, I can't perfuse my temporal lobes of the brain. You see that shrinking on the MRI, right? Or is it because, um, or is it because I, I'm using maybe some products that I'm allergic to or something like that, right? Or is it because I work three jobs to support a family and, um, and I only have four hours to sleep, so I have no time to regenerate, which also increases inflammation, right? And so, uh, but that's a good question, though. You know, inflammation, I don't think is the root cause of anything because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a system. Uh, and in Chinese medicine, it's, it's all about, you know, the imbalance between the yin and the yang. The yang, whenever you're on the yang dominant side, is inflammation. And there's there, it's there for a reason. Now we have to figure out, like, what's really going on. To go back to Chinese medicine for a sec, I remember my medical acupuncture course about the the hushi and the breathing and essentially in the west we are taught to inhale first before exhale yeah but this idea of inhale first before exhale often people overemphasize that inhale and then that leads to a sympathetic nervous system dominant state what do you think about have you ever um advised your patients for instance to like try to exhale before the inhale and, and curious about that that's a really good point. And um, this, this whole thing be between inhalation and exhalation comes from the fact that um, in the Western culture, our guts are always sucked in. All right. So when we're out walking, we don't want our guts to look very big. And so we never, we, we retain a lot of air that's in there. Right. And whenever it's people take a deep breath, everyone's trying to increase their, their chest. No, you want to increase the width of your gut so you can draw all the air towards the bottom of the lungs and when you exhale you want to squeeze your gut in for the exhalation process um but you know people are air retainers i call them right and so the actual the actual concept of breathing uh should be soft belly breathing where your belly is just really soft and not tensed up right and so, you know, why do uh, Victorian women who wear corsets and stuff like that, they pass out, you know, if they stand up for too long, it's because they have no air coming into the body, right? And so, uh, and why do people, uh, and why do people who, for example, go diving, um, their nose is covered, but they're getting oxygen through their mouth. Why is their blood pressure always elevated? And they may feel this sort of sense of air hunger is because, when you put air only through your mouth, you're not able to also get that deep breath and oxygen can't be delivered to the capillary. So, so divers can only stay water for so long, even though they may have a really long and endless supply of oxygen, right? And so our, our, our breathing mechanisms, you know, through the nose and out um, through the mouth uh, or through the nose as well, requires a lot of activation of muscles within our belly. So yes, uh, I agree with you that when people start the exhalation process, the belly draws in, they actually have to let the belly to expand out again to draw all the air into the bottom part of the lungs and also activate systems within the body that, that balance the body as well. I love how we always, we're, we're starting to talk about the, some of these, some of these foundational 
you know, fundamental basics that anyone could do. Any of the listeners out there that wanted to promote their own brain health, brain health, their loved ones, just starting with breathing. And, and some of these examples seem extreme, like divers and Victorian women corsets, but the reality is we're probably all breathing that way a lot of the time, or even <laughs> yeah. most of the time, you know? So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, not only are we all breathing that way, we're, 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 we're taught to breathe that way. It's normal, right? It's sort of the normal society way, right? We don't want to have a, 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 a happy belly or, you know, a, a gut that's sticking out that's not considered socially appropriate. Although it, it might be physiologically beneficial for us to breathe that way. To have yes, that belly. yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Go to food now. Um, we know that food is medicine. You know, we've kind of learned that throughout our, our training and all that. How does nutrition impact brain health? And do you recommend any particular ways of eating for better brain health? Or is that kind of more individualized per person? Yeah, actually, brain health, uh, brain health determines nutrition. Um, and so a lot of patients come in, I wanted to switch the topic a little bit on if you put the too much emphasis on the food, um, the way of eating gets in the way. I'll give you a really good example. So right now, there's a lot of phenomenon when it comes to like raw vegan diets and juicing and stuff like that. Um, there's a there's an issue with that. And the issue with that is that it's not just the food going to the body, it's how you're actually consuming the food. If there's no act, if you're juicing and there's no act of chewing and there's not enough time mm. for saliva to be produced yeah. Yeah. and, and the, uh, people are eating like in their cars on the go, sipping on the smoothie in traffic. So your body's in fight or flight. When your body's in fight or flight, you don't have mechanisms in your gut to digest. It's like trying to drink a smoothie when running away from a tiger, right? It's just not it, it, like the body doesn't compute. This is how food allergies occur, is that most people think it's the food. It has nothing to do with the food. It has to do with the body is not ready to accept the food, right? And because you're eating on the go, uh, wolfing down things just to get to the next thing. So whenever you do that, you create food intolerances. This is why I don't like um, doing food intolerance tests very much. It's because... If you eat one way one week, eat the other way the next week, your food intolerance test will completely change. And it has to do with just slowing down, being mindful of what you're eating. And so we've seen this in, in studies, looking at the, the, the speed at which people eat, the number of times they chew. Your body decreases inflammation the more you actually chew the food because it's, it's prep, your brain is actually preparing your body for that digestive process. And not only that, every time you chew, your brain frequency goes from super high frequency to low calmer frequency. It's called the alpha frequency. And the alpha frequency is when you can be more calm, the serotonin's upregulated, you have more nitric oxide delivering blood flow to the gut. You have your digestive enzyme that's made by the pancreas and the gut. And then, and then when the food comes in, the gut's ready for it, right? And though, so the speed at which we eat is more important than the actual ingredients now i'm not saying go out and eat four burgers at mcdonald's i'm not saying that at all it's just that um, what we see is that even when people eat super healthy but they're perpetually in the fight or flight state then they're going to de- develop reactions to food they're going to have they can have eczema they can have asthma and all stuff like that and they can't really tolerate a lot of the food uh very readily so the brain still ha- you know occurs first right that's an excellent point you, you just made it's not only about what we eat, but like you said, maybe even more important, like how we eat and like how we're digesting the, the chewing of the food, you know, 25 to 30 bites per chew, you would say, something like that. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, how does brain dysfunction affect the person's ability to, to chew and digest? I, I wonder if like brain dysfunction itself might actually impair someone's ability to digest. Yeah, so this is, um, it's not just the brain, it's, um, it's the central nerves as well, especially the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve comes from the brain stem, which is the bottom part of the brain. And it, it's called the vagus nerve because it's like a vagabond, which kind of wanders everywhere. So it's called the wandering nerve. And the vagus nerve innervates our heart, our gut, um, the outside portions of our lungs, uh, our blood vessels, the tips of our fingers and stuff like that. And so, um, and there's different mechanisms and different sections to the actual vagus nerve. And so sometimes uh, when there's structural brain damage, either with concussions or um, just long-term, you know, chronic asthma and not an ability to breathe very, very well, you can actually impair the way that the, the vagus system uh, is created as well. 
And not only that, um, you take someone like myself who's had multiple concussions and cervical spine issues in the past, the, the, a lot of the, the modulation of the vagus nerve um, actually exists in, in your C-spine, in your neck spine right here. And so there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, concussive and physical trauma that can really affect the way that vagus nerve works. It really affects our digestion and immune response and stuff like that. So I think it is definitely a two-way street. Um, and then the last part about um, the vagus nerve is that, guess what? If we don't breathe correctly, <laughs> our vagus nerve doesn't get activated the way it should be. So, um, and if we take 10 deep breaths, a lot of the regulation can, can actually come through. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, we have breath training court, uh, group visit in my facility that's run by Jenny Moreno, our mind-body medicine practitioner. That's everyone's favorite course, uh, favorite group session, is because you realize no one's really taught anyone how to breathe properly. And then when they do, all of a sudden, people who are constipated start having bowel movements, right? Um, there's this great story. We were doing a group Tai Chi one day, and we just started with the breath training process. And two people had to get up and originally go to the bathroom, and they weren't able to, to have a bowel movement for like a week, <laughs> you know? And so, and they were very happy after that. And so that's how important that breathing and that vagus nerve really comes in because the vagus nerve controls the, the, the squeezing of your gut as well. So yeah, it is definitely a two-way stream. Like you said, it's it's chronically suppressed by by different issues, TBI, oh, yeah. depression, asthma, like a lot, a lot of different things really that are causing that suppression. Um, speaking of that with with breathing, this might get into a little bit of a general question about meditation, but yes. can meditation help our brains? And, and if so, how much meditation do you recommend or what types of meditation I would say? Yeah, so well, let's let's define meditation for a second. I think there's some preconceived notions there that meditation is sort of a religious thing. It's, it's not, it's, um, it's a mindfulness thing. And meditation also doesn't mean shut off your brain and do nothing. <laughs> I think a lot of people are frustrated when they can't meditate. Uh, no, meditation um, has to do with checking into your physical and spiritual body um, for a good five minutes. Um, and, you know, not even five minutes. You can just do that for two minutes. Uh, you can as well. And it's about redirecting focus to self. And when we redirect our focus to self, we start noticing things about us and our body that we haven't before. And when you combine breath and meditation, I mean, that time is for, for ourselves. And um, meditation is one of the most powerful genetic triggers, we call it epigenetic triggers. So genetics basically is the genes that you're born with. And epigenetics are th things that modulate those genes to, to do something. The, the meditation and breath work is one of the quickest ways you can change your gene expression. I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastically fast and your brain starts liking it and it's able to go into a lower frequency uh, from a super high frequency, like a stress state. Uh, and, then, uh, and then eventually when you get more in tune with yourself, your brain can exist in multiple frequencies and do multiple things. And you also, you, you kind of start understanding uh, what your body and brain is really capable of. I think meditation is the crux of medicine. Um, and uh, we really have to uh, view it as, as important as, you know, going on a clean diet and, and taking your supplements and, and stuff like that is because meditation is free. Anyone can do it in any situation that they're in. And the Center for, for Mind-Body Medicine, you know, right now, their, their leader, uh, Dr. Gordon, is, is in Ukraine right now teaching, you know, war-torn countries and a meditative state to get into that because it doesn't require any more resource other than your brain. And so we have to view it as, as an improvement in primary function. And we see a lot of great data coming out of medication, in almost all disease states. And so I think it's, it's, it's exceptionally important and exceptionally uh, essential. I agree, meditation is huge. I believe it even comes from the same root word as medicine to, to, to make yeah, it whole yeah. on everything. And, and like you said, there are a couple of points there just to highlight what you said uh, to listeners. Um, a, it's self-care, it's basic life support. You only need it for two minutes at a, at a time um, it, or, or more, of course, but you know you don't need that much time. It's free, it's accessible. Um, 
What do you say to someone that is like worried about Ukraine or some of the other world problems, COVID, we're in the third year now, in terms of like the worry and the, the anxiety and stuff, and they, they can't really even do that. Like, what, what would you say to that kind of person? Yeah, you know, and I quote my mentor, Tony Robbins, on this one is the quality of life depends on the quality of your focus. So whatever you're kind of focusing on is um, can can change your, your belief system and structures in a way where you can snap yourself out of a self-destructive state or a depressive state, right? Um, and, you know, there's this video uh, of Tony Robbins actually talking to someone that's in the audience, and he's going on and on about how his life sucks and and he's really devalued. Uh, and then, you know, Tony says, hey, I love your red shoes. He's like, wait, what? He's like, oh, I love your red shoes. They, they look fabulous. <laughs> and then you see this crack of a smile on his face of someone who's talking about killing themselves, right? And then all of a sudden, it, the, the focus is redirected. He's able to snap people out of things. You know, uh, one of the things that I recommend for people to do is that if you're really bothered by a lot of stuff that's going on out there, um, a lot of it's outside of our control, but there's a lot of things that are within our control, right? I can say that, okay, I may be bothered by some of these events that are outside, but what have I done uh, to plan for my daughter's birthday coming up, right? Um, and, and get our own house at home organized first before we worry about someone else's house, right? And there's always room for improvement there. And that is the quality of our focus, and a lot of times, and I'll tell you this, and people who are listening may, may even recognize this within themselves, we choose to focus on things that we have no control over is because we feel like we have no control over, over some of the aspects of our lives that, um, that are creating a destructive process within our brains. And this is natural, right? But just as much as you're worried about wars and stuff like that, um, make a list and just shift your mindset for two, from here to here, two millimeters left and say, okay, I'm gonna do something about this, right? And so whatever you choose that to be, have an appreciation process for it and appreciate yourself for it. And that actually is actually meditation, not talking about you going in and sitting down in deep sleep, but just cha changing your mindset for 30 seconds and playing this game called what if the opposite was true? Say, okay, well, what if the opposite is true of my belief system here? How would I feel about that? And then you change into, well, could the opposite be true? Well, how do I find out the opposite is true? And that gets rid of a lot of resentment. And this is how I actually uh, build businesses as well. In team training, um, we, we try to get rid of resentment within, within people within the organization uh, because there's a lot of preconceived notions of people's actions. So we kind of play this game, what if the opposite is true? Well, how do you find out? And it creates this wonderful family dynamic and culture within businesses and organizations. Um, but it's something that we can do uh, for ourselves on a daily basis, sort of play that game with ourselves. And I think that there's a quote that we have 60,000 thoughts daily. Um, and a lot of those are repetitive. So if we can change our thoughts, change your mindset, we can change your lives. Just like you said, your, your mentor said, uh, uh, Tony Robbins, it's really huge. Um, and, and, you know, even, even in situations that, you know, like you said, we don't have total control over or any control over, um, there were, there's still are some actual steps you can start with yourself. You can start with some maybe actions to, to help others that are more measurable, that there are things we can control. You know, at least we can, you know, kind of put a positive, um, yeah. you know, attitude on that and action on that. So, um, yeah. and I guess the other thing I wanted to mention about brain health as we kind of wrap up this part is, how does connection or lack of connection impact our, our brain health? Um, you know, just. And when you say connection, I guess you're talking about. I think about social maybe... connection, just the feeling okay. of, of not, not being alone, um, you know, not being isolated. Because we know that a lot of people, or at least I found it in our practice, a lot of people that have brain health issues, ultimately they also have maybe loneliness issues or purpose or joy issues and things like that, which I think we, we all can have at some point, but um, it just, just if you could comment on the importance of connection mm. to our health. So um, not too long ago, I posted this on my Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, if you guys want to check that out, it's just my name, C-H-E-N-G. Last name is R-U-A-N-M-D, Changron M-D. And I posted a story of how um, in 2014, a, a seven-minute conversation really changed my life, the way I view medicine. Um, 
in the story is someone come in and she's very diabetic <laughs> and she's seen a bazillion different doctors and dietitians and still very quite diabetic and then she comes in and she's like you know doc i know we're going to tell me to do tell me to stop eating sugar and i can't i'm just addicted i don't know how to do that but there's got to be some other way what can you prescribe me right i'm like okay i was like well before we get too far into the how let's let's talk about the why and the first thing I want you to do is I want you to pretend we want to play this game called what if the opposite is true. So imagine for a second, just close your eyes. Just imagine that sugar is like the most nutritious substance like on the face of the earth. And the more you eat, the better you get. How does that feel for you? Um, and then, you know, she started, her, her lips quivered a little bit because there's an emotional thing. And, uh, and, I, and I thought, okay, we're, we're, we're onto something here. And she's like, well, it feels great. Um, and part, and we found out part of the reason is because she said that, you know, growing up in Poland, her mother had this cart that she rolled around and it's, uh, and she's a sugar um, artist, if you will, that, uh, and she creates the art on the little cart and it goes up in a stick. I think we have that in China as well. And so um, that's how she supported her and her four siblings or five siblings. I can't remember the number now. And by the way, this, this, this lady is over eight years old, so much a lot of a lot of great years in, under her belt and so i'm like okay well um and i asked her could it possibly be that whenever doctors tell you to stop eating sugar or dietitians um that you're subconsciously forced to reject your your mother's love and she started crying she's like i want to say no but if i don't or, or, but i'm crying so maybe yes <laughs> right and so i'm like okay well, great. So what if you look at this chair and next to you is your, is your mother who's already passed away. This is your mother. And what if I tell your mother that, hey, um, you know, your daughter's really diabetic and sugar could be quite destructive from a health standpoint. What would your mother say to you right now? She's like, well, she'd tell me to stop eating the sugar. I'm like, awesome. So my role here is purely to respect the wishes of your mother. And that was the end of the seven minute conversation. Three months later, um, her A1C dropped. I mean, she was no longer diabetic out of all the medicines and really just took that conversation because she had the new know-how, but her identity, her identity was something that we wanted to really target. So her identity is someone who's a caregiver. She gives care to her family. She honors her, her culture and her mother. And subconsciously, she felt like she was forced to deny her culture Right. And then when we play sort of this game of what if the opposite is true and kind of visualize that process, she had a massive behavioral change because I didn't force her to change her identity. All I told her to do was have a conversation with your mother and honor her, her in her life. And so that flipped the script for her because this is what I like to call identity based medicine, where we're not talking about the outcomes. We're not talking about the blood sugars. No, we're just talking about the belief structures and belief systems. And that is a connection. And so, you know, you asked about connections. That is the connection she's had with her mom who's already passed away for many decades for a, over a long period of time. And that connection allows that behavioral change, uh, you know, and then, and that was 2014. So, you know, now um, she's not just got rid of diabetes. She's, she's, she's doing running and stuff, at, you know, at the age of 80 something years old. And, uh, and I see her on, on, on her Instagram, she got an Instagram after that conversation nice. <laughs> and really started like these elderly groups and stuff like that. So she's really honored her self and her mother without sacrificing that honor by building a strong connection with her community. So I think connection is everything. I think the connection should be the foundation of how we practice medicine. Yeah, it's an incredible story. And I did check that on your feed, uh, Changran MD. Everyone, just please check that out. Um, he has a great story. You have great stories on there. Um, really getting to the true root, I feel, of health and wellness with a lot of your teachings and education. So yeah, we can't thank you enough for that and for being on today. Really appreciate it, Chang. Um, for yourself, I think just, I think maybe people want to know that, um, what do you do every day to cultivate joy yourself? We know that joy is so important for health. That's a closing question. We often ask, ask our guests. Yeah. So it's a really good question. And, uh, my wife's going to laugh when, when she hears this. Um, but every time we make a decision or my family, my kids, and I have three, three young daughters and I live with my parents too. So we're in a three generation Chinese household. Here. Nice. Nice. And whenever we make decisions and if, if some, there's a disagreement about something, the easiest thing to do is, okay, 
what is the one decision we can do right now with absolutely zero regrets, right? And then we choose to do that. And then whenever I ask that question, it becomes simple of what we should actually do and the altercation just kind of stops. And so, um, and so that was sort of the running joke is that, you know, if, if something comes up and there's some sort of conflict, I'm always gonna say, okay, what is the one decision with no regrets? Okay, let's just do it, unapologetic, let's just get it done, right? And so uh, there's that. And then the second thing I do is I ask why a lot. You know, my daughter says, why is my favorite letter in the, in the alphabet? And it's like, why? So whenever someone is doing something and uh, instead of just, you know, instead of just doing it, I always like to ask why is there a bigger picture that's there and that also uh, really forms our connection, our relationship. So those are two things I like to do. Yeah, and speaking of your daughter, she's super amazing. And if she's on the... Uh... The, the practice course that I'm taking that, that you're, you're uh, you should have with your daughter. Yeah. She's, she's so cute and uh, smart. I could, I could just like see a lot of uh, her uh, in with your, your wisdom as well. So um, yeah, yeah. So, so Dr. Ron Chang, uh, thanks for coming on today. How can listeners learn more about you? And uh, you know, this, this is really a very uh, broad kind of podcast. You know, we have, you know, patients, but also clinicians and, and everyone. So you might want to sure. have different, uh, different mechanisms or ways to, for people to reach you. Yeah. So, um, I'm all addressed the public out there. So if you want to follow me on social media, just search my name, Chang Ron, M-B-C-H-E-N-G-R-U-A-N-N-D. I'm on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and someone tells me I'm on Pinterest and I just found out that's to be true. <laughs> so, um, there's a whole Pinterest pin of me. And then, um, for the doctors out there, just go ahead and reach out to me on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn, I actually talk about uh, more practice building and the, the perception of where medicine should really lead post-pandemic era. Um, and uh, and also, I'm the creator of Integrative Practice Builder. So if you go to integrativepracticebuilder.com, that's me. I actually teach uh, how to practice medicine with core values and tie it into uh, insurances and Medicare and stuff like that. So it can serve a much larger audience for those integrative health uh, practitioners. And in January of 2023, uh, I'm holding a very large summit uh, with my uh, partner, Jason Prawl, who is the uh, creator of the Human Longevity Project in 2018. It was on TV. And we're, our, we're going to be focusing on something called better brain health. And um, it's basically talking about a lot of things I talk about here with some celebrities and surprise guests. So uh, if you follow me on Instagram and Facebook, I'll be posting more events there uh, as well. And so you guys can follow along there as well. Thank you so much, Chung. I'm uh, looking forward to the Brain Summit. Uh, I know that'll be very epic and uh, look forward to seeing uh, what else that you do in the space, the leadership space here of um, integrative and functional health. But I, I would say even just like medicine in general, I mean, th this is, you know, at this point in time, you know, we're in 2022 now, we're really, um, I, I feel like integrative functional medicine and, and, and all the different associated types of, you know, medicine like that, it's, it's starting to branch out more into, it's becoming more accepted, I think. And I think there's more people out there, whether it's clinicians, whether it's, you know, maybe insurance companies even, I don't know, but um, certainly uh, patients, you know, are, are kind of wanting to see more of a root cause approach to brain health and, and just health in general. So uh, thank you for being a leader in this space. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. Appreciate you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us today. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to leave us a review. It helps our podcast to reach more listeners. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our next episodes and conversations. And thank you so much again for being with us.